Hey, everybody. This is Nick Lowry, Kansas City Chiefs Hall of Fame, all-time leading scorer for the Kansas City Chiefs, director of Canterway Sports. And it is such a pleasure to talk each week with professional athletes, Olympic champions, uh, people that have had lots of adversity, but still overcame and became champions despite, not because it wasn't an adverse, uh, challenging time uh, for them during different phases of their lives, but because they found a way. So uh, last week when we kicked off our show, we had uh, an outstanding beginning with Solomon Wilcox, and then uh, we're moving on. We move on to Christian Nkoye, uh, the Nigerian nightmare. And then our third guest is Brian Barker, all pro punter for 16 years in the NFL. And, you know, there are a lot of Dallas Cowboys. Fans. I grew up with the Redskins back then playing against the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, we hated the Cowboys, but at the same time, every good rivalry demands two great teams. And the most famous franchise in the NFL, if it isn't the Patriots, uh, if it isn't the Packers, it's the Steelers, it's probably the Dallas Cowboys. And people still call them America's team. There's something about it. There's the glow about them. There's a certain uh, star quality about them. And they actually are represented by a big star. So one of their stars who's joining us today, who's going to talk about his book, talk about his journey in life, is one of my favorite people in Phoenix, who's a former star at Arizona State and running back and kick returner, Daryl Clack. Thanks for joining us, Daryl. Hey, Nick. How you doing? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You bet. And, you know, you have been a man of God. You've been a man who uh, uh, walks his talk. And uh, I really am excited to share your story um, because what we don't want to do is put our athletes on a pedestal where no one can really relate to them. We want people to realize every single human being on the planet has their faults, is not perfect, yet they're perfect, I think, because of that, because they're human. Daryl, tell us about what it was like for you growing up in Colorado, going to Widefield High, being a two-sport track champion. And let me tell you, in addition to football, you never, is this really true? You never lost a race in track? Never lost a race in track. Three years <laughs> in high school, three years. Three-year state champion, 100 meters, 200 meters, and 400 meters as well. That's the just state championship. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, for those of you that – know anything about track there is such a difference and when Usain Bolt won the 100 and 200 most people figured out he probably wouldn't do that great in the 400 and that last 200 meters when you've blown it out with 200 it is so hard to maintain that toughness that physical and mental toughness for 400 yards that says everything to me there is almost no one that's not lost a race at those three races in fact I'd love to see if anyone really has matched that race that ability to be state champion for how many years? Three years. Three years. Three back-to-back -back years, yeah. At 100 meters, 200 meters, 200 and 400 meters. 400 meters yeah. now, let's start with that. Let's talk about track and um, what it meant for you to be a two-sport athlete, but in particular, what you learned from track and the training, the mental toughness. Everybody always thinks about the physical training, but the right, mental right. toughness you got in Colorado as uh, well, a Hall of Famer in the uh, Colorado High School Hall of Fame. Yes, uh, you know, track was my, actually track was my favorite sport. Um, you know, I loved it, you know, I watched it, I followed it, and I always wanted to be a track, track superstar um, growing up as a kid. Um, and so uh, from junior high, that's when I actually started running track, then I was able to see some success with winning in track. Now this is just in junior high, so you know, it's not really no no detailed, no professional training, just getting out there just running, basically, junior high school back then, you know. And, and then by the time I got to high school, um, you know, there were some people that started to kind of identify the talent that I had, which was some coaches identify some talent that I had and say, hey, you know, we may have, you may have something here with this trap thing, you know. Um, but at the same time, I was also playing football too. So I was always, I always played, more than one sport. I played football, I played basketball, I did track. Um, so I was always doing different things, but I'm, I seem like I'm, I excelled more in track than football. So track was number one, football was number two. 
you know, and so I had a coach recruit me out of junior high school uh, to attend his high school. I mean, he was a football coach. And so at the time, you know, I'm a, I'm a military brat. So we were actually stationed in Colorado Springs um, at the army base out there. And so, you know, I was going to go to this other high school, which is called Fountain High School. But then when the coach recruited me to go to his high school, which is Lytle High School, he said, look, we have a good winning tradition here. We got great athletes coming here, so forth. So, you know, convinced my mom and she said, okay, yeah, we'll move over to this area where I can attend at high school. And that's kind of how it started. And then when I got to high school, you know, I was just running, just running, you know, and uh, I just enjoyed it and I saw myself winning. You know, and at the same time, you know, it got to a period where it's like, I really enjoy winning and I put a goal to never lose. And so I trained and I trained and I trained and I trained. And before you know it, I'm just winning races every meet. <laughs> so when you say you trained. Yes. Not so specifics for those of us that so, want to go out and, and see. What was a typical practice for you when you say training for track? So what I did was um, I almost almost did like year round training. So what I did was along with competing and training in high school, I also ran in a track team, which is during the summertime. So the track team was called the Colorado Springers. And it was a, uh, a they call it time called Junior Olympics, basically. Right. And so I had a particular coach that really trained me to really emphasize on fundamentals and technique. What's a fundamental? What's a, what's a technique? Technique is like your arm movement, your leg movement, you know, uh, foot speed, endurance. Um, and then at the same time, having a mental drive to want to win, you know. And so that's where it started for me was having that mental motivation. Like when you're on that track, you're not friends with anybody. You know, it's about you against everybody else on that track and that the mental aspect. You know, that's something yourself. I will, I would say I would resonate, resonate with is when I made it in the NFL, I had to convince myself of that exact thing. I'm not friends with anybody. Forgive the expression, but screw everybody in the stadium. They're right. all my enemies. It's exactly. me. I've got to get it done. And it's not, it's not the arrogant me, but it's close to it. It's something that puts you in a place where you create a sort of impregnable shield around yourself emotionally so you exactly. can concentrate on the physical action and not let fear and nerves overwhelm you. Exactly. You know, and it's just, you know, you just having that, that mental focus, like you just zoomed in on what you're trying to accomplish and what you want to do. And it's no distractions that can take you away from that. And that's kind of the mental toughness that I had when I ran track, you know, it's like, I'm so focused. I don't want to hear nothing from nobody. I'm not a trash talker, but people around me were talking trash. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, whatever. Okay, let's put it on the track and see what happens, you know. And so well, that's kind of was my drive. Let me ask you a question. So uh, a lot of uh, the children of some of the brand ambassadors, I bet, have to uh, confront this challenge because they're on a basketball court, they're at a volleyball game, they're at a soccer game uh, or a European football game or an NFL football game or whatever it is. They're watching people talking trash. And then they yeah. think, well, maybe I need to. Michael Jordan would trade trash talk. Mar Marcus Allen, my teammate, was a great trash talker. But right. it can take you off your game, too. So what advice yeah. would you give to a young athlete when somebody's talking trash to him? How does he or she navigate that so they don't, get, they don't have their energy drawn away from the competition? I think it's, it's not getting caught up in it. You know, because a lot of times when they tra talk trash to you, it's to take you away from your focus. Or, or your your game. And that's why they do it. And it's an insecurity that they have. And so understanding that, then then that's what I did. I said, okay, well, obviously he's worried about something or he's scared about something. Otherwise, why is he over here talking trash to me as opposed to him focusing on what he has to do? You know what I mean? And so I, my whole deal is don't let him take you into that with them. Stay focused. And let your trash talking be done with success on whatever it is, if it's volleyball, basketball, track, by winning, by being successful at it. If you do that, it shuts them up. Then you'll never hear from them again. And it, and it shuts up the fans. There's nothing like kicking a 55-yard field goal. Exactly. And they're all screaming obscenities at you. Suddenly, the stadium goes silent. And you gently yeah. trot off and just go like this, like as yeah. we said last week. 
Marcus Allen would say, act like you've been there before. Exactly. Don't act surprised that you did something yeah. that you paid to do or that you yeah. expect to do. So right. let's, let's move on from there. What about studies at, at Whitefield? Uh, how did you manage the burden or you know the challenge of, of managing being a great athlete with being a good enough student so that you could then go to ASU and, and uh, by the way, say no to Notre Dame and just about every other college. In the <laughs> well, I think, I think what happened was at that particular time, because we was a military brat, I was a military brat, my, my family was military. Uh, there, was, there was a statement that my mom said one time. She said, listen, son, uh, we're in a situation where we cannot afford to send you to college. So it's either you get us able to get a scholarship or you may have to go into the military. When she made that statement, I was like, well, there's no flipping way I'm going to go into the military. So I have to do what I have to do to make sure I'm able to get a scholarship to school. And so to college. So what I did was I studied, you know, a lot of my homeboys, a lot of my friends were out hanging out, partying and everything. Guess what I was doing? If I wasn't practicing my sport, I was home studying. You know, I didn't have any jobs. Like a lot, I had a lot of friends that had jobs. I didn't have a job. I studied, I practiced, I studied, I practiced. And that was all I did. Tell us about your coach. What was the name of your coach and what was the way that he prepared you for college? So his name was Coach Gentry. And this coach was a, a track coach. Uh, now I had a lot of coaches, my football coach, uh, Coach Taylor, Coach McCarthy. A lot of these coaches uh, from high school were, were good good mentors and good coachings, but this one particular coach uh, that was my track coach on the track team I ran on was, he was something special because it was a lot of one-on-one -on -one with him. And it was a lot of, outside of him coaching me, but outside of him sitting me down and talking to me and getting me to understand what it takes to be successful at the next level, okay? Because I wanted to go to college and so he's like, well, it's easy for a high school student to have success because, you know, some, most high schools you may have maybe a handful of students that are just your top students. But when you get to college, everybody is top. Everybody is great. Everybody is good. So you have to be able to set yourself above that by training, by practicing, by being focused and, and being determined and setting your goals to make sure this is what you want to accomplish. And he would sit there and have these conversations with me and make me understand the importance of setting goals and working hard to obtain those goals. Not just to come out and just be a, a superstar athlete and that's it. No, take it to the next level, you know? And that's kind of what he did with me. And he taught me to have very strong work ethic, you know? And, and, and he used to also tell me this, you know, because, he always say, sport only lasts for so long. The key is when sport, the sport is over, that same mentality, that same focus, that same drive, that same work ethic, you should be able to take that to another part of your life, whether it's working, whether whatever the, whatever the case may be, this is something that should be instilling you no matter what you do, set your goals, and continue to con continue with this work ethic. And he had this conversation with me on a day-to-day -day basis. And that, what, to me, was a big deal for me because that's what I did. And that's what I do now in today's life, in today's world. Let's, let's uh, talk, before we move on to college, um, tell us about the role of your father and mother in the military uh, mm -hmm. with that structure and with the right. idea in the military that there's a structure, that there's a code of honor that there is a work ethic and those things, there's a sense of service, literally national yeah. service. How do you think that affected you as you look back? Uh, it, 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 it helped me a lot, be, but because now I understand, and I, as I got older, I understood, but as a kid, I didn't understand because it, being in the military back then, we had to move every two years. Yep. You know, so it was like, I get settled, two years later, we have to move to another state. Or I get settled, and then two years later, he's getting transferred to Germany. Or I get, we get settled, and he has to come back and leave again to go to Korea. And so it was always every two years, there was really no stability with me as far as me. 
you know, continue to be stable where I was at. The good thing about that was is it, it, it caused me to improve and have better social skills. Yes. Meaning that I had to go out friends. and learn to meet, meet, meet friends and make friends, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think one of the things as a kid, I didn't understand it. And so I hated it as a kid. But then as I got older and started to see things, it made sense. Okay, now I understand. This is what it instilled in me by being a military brat. And so a lot of times my dad, he was always, if he was overseas, he missed a lot of my sports. You know, I think he missed a lot of my football. He caught a lot of my track. Or missed a lot and of you my didn't go to Germany with him. Gone. You didn't go no, to Germany. I didn't go. So my, it was my... Right when I was getting getting ready to go into high school, he got stationed over to Germany, and they had to make a decision. Him, my mom, between either going to Germany or staying in the states, and so they decided because of my st- sports to stay in the states, stay in Colorado. So my dad left for two years of Germany, and we stayed in Colorado Springs, where I was able to continue my sports there. So they they did a sacrifice by being apart while I could stay in Colorado for sports. Okay, let's move on to, um, you know, the big decision going to ask you, what, what about Daryl Rogers made you feel so confident? Uh, what is it that an athlete should look for in a head coach, in that mentor figure, that authority figure, that father figure uh, mm-hmm. that drew you to ASU and allowed you to be a star there? I wanted a, uh, we looked at someone who was going to be honest, genuine, and to be able to push me to get to the next level. I mean, because by the time I was a senior in high school, and, I, and my mama tell you this, I sat there and told her one of my goals was is to play in the NFL and to play for Dallas Cowboys. That was my goal as a senior in high school. And I actually told my mom one day, this is what I want to do. And so when we meet, met all these coaches, we met Barry Switzer and John Robinson from, from Southern Cal and all these and, and, and uh, coach, uh, coach Holtz, Lou Holtz, you know, all these hall of fame, awesome coaches um, that came and, and recruited me. But for some reason, it was just really genuine with coach Daryl Rogers and his coaching staff. Um, you know, the one main coach that recruited me was his name was coach Bob Baker. And he was actually the running backs coach and office quarter coordinator for Arizona state Sun Devils. And um, he came and he literally, he was like, he was like, you know, like a father that's not, there because he took me on his wing he talked to me he was honest with me he, he he protected me he guided me you know he told me when i did wrong and he praised me when i did right and that was one of the things that i really enjoyed about a coach because for the next four years you know it's like this is where i'm going to be at and parents are going to you know have their kids be and follow and make these coaches mentor their kids to become young men and that was the key for looking for a good coach in a university to attend. And Arizona State was one was the one I chose. What was that like for you at Arizona State? Now you're playing in front of 50,000 people. You've got a national power, uh, beautiful weather, beautiful girls, lots of potential distractions, being a star on the football team. Um, what was the biggest, let's start with this. What was the biggest mistake you made in your first couple of years? And what did you learn from it that made you ready for the National Football League? Uh, well, I think it was because uh, when I first when I first got there, it was just so amazing. That campus was gorgeous, and, and it's like you said, you know, everything was just so a lot of big palm trees and sunshine, and, and 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 you know, just great. And and so I got here, and you know, it was just you know, it was the first time I was ever away from home, you know. And so it was one of those situations where you like you just all over the place, you know, <laughs> you just hanging out, partying, you know, doing things, you know, that young kids do, but losing sight of why you're there. You know what I mean? And so, you know, I kind of lost sight when I first got here. And so my grades, my grades dropped a little bit, you know, and then I had to get a wake up call to say, Hey, you know, if you don't get your grades up, then you may be ineligible to play. That was your freshman year? That was my freshman year, you know, because the thing about it is they didn't, they didn't research, redshirt me my freshman, my freshman year. I actually ended up playing. And so that was like the biggest thing, like, oh, wow, you know, I really got to step up my game here and get back to what I'm here to do and what I want to accomplish. And it changed it. And I, and I didn't turn back since. 
And let me explain to those that don't uh, know redshirting. Redshirting means a player is chosen not to play. They sort of season him. So then when he's ready to play, he then has four years because I think the NCAA allows you to have five years to complete four seasons. Is four, that true? Correct. That's correct. Yeah. So that's some correct. teams will bring in a guy that's 18, 19, maybe a little immature, doesn't know the system and has right. to make that adjustment to college life. And so they may well redshirt him maybe because he's not ready um, or maybe they already have talent at that position for one more year. And then they bring him right. in and he's really ready. Maybe put some, some weight on him, some strength on him too, because the college game is a lot more physical. What was it like? The first big hit that you took returning a kick for ASU. What was that like? It, it was a rush, you know, at the same time, because, you know, it's like, you know, it's, 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 it's like you said, Nick, it's a different, it's a different game. It's a different world, you know, and as a, as a young kid, you know, to see 50 plus thousand people in the stands yelling and screaming and, and as a matter of fact, what they even did was they even they, they generate these little this little toy called click clackers. Oh um, yeah. So every time, so every time I would get on the field, you would hit a stadium with these clacking noises, you know. And so there was something they were selling in, in the stands to all the fans, and it was huge. And it was like, wow, you know, this is something else. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. And so it's very exciting. All right. So now you're heading towards your junior and senior year. Tell us one big game. What was the best game you ever had? I can think of two games. Uh, one is against Southern Cal and another one's against Stanford. And when I say these two games, it's because those two games is where I actually rushed for over 100 yards in rushing and received for over 100 yards in wow. passing. First freshman to ever do that. As a and freshman? So, as a freshman. Wow. Yeah, as a freshman. And so those two games stick out the most because, of, you know, those schools are two powerhouse schools, you know. And at the time, you know, I didn't realize it until while I was playing that it, I just figured it was just another university, but didn't realize as a freshman how big these schools are within, at that time it was the Pac-10 versus the Pac-12 now. It was the Pac-10. And so uh, those two games really stuck out because I've had, I had over 80 some yards, uh, one play rushing, and over 80 some yards, one play passing. Um, and so, you know, I had a lot of, you know, breakaway speed and a lot of things, open field running that really stood out for people. And it, it also, I led the Pac-10 in, in uh, uh, yards per, rut, per per carry and that year too as well. And so it was very exciting for me and as, as, a, most freshman. Part, as a freshman. All right. So you're getting towards the end of your, your career at ASU, getting ready for the NFL. Uh, was there a mentor besides Daryl Rogers or someone, uh, maybe a teammate, someone that inspired you? Uh, you talk about Herschel Walker. You go on to join him at right. the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, who is the person that inspired you as you're getting ready to play in the NFL? Because, you know, some players can't recover when people um, criticize them for being arrogant because they actually think they can play in the NFL. Um, right. What was it that allowed you, who was the person that inspired you to think, I can not only make it, I can be a great player in the NFL? Uh, I would say one of the coaches at Arizona State's name is Ivy Williams. Um, so uh, he was one of, he was a very inspirational coach to me because, um, you know, he kind of uh, helped me because this, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. So my senior year, I got injured. So uh, third game of the season. And I had ended up having a stress fracture in my lower right leg. So it caused me to not be able to play for the rest of the season. So I was out. Um, this is my senior year. And so I kept contemplating on to stay another year as what they call a medical hardship. So I'll get another, another year of eligibility to play. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to go to NFL so bad, you know. And so, you know, through talking to him and uh, talking to some of my teammates, uh, Stein Koss, uh, his name is Stein Koss, another teammate of mine, his name is Jeff Van Rapport. So these are guys that we came in together. Um, and just through talking to them and, and trying to get a, a feel of what I should do, um, they supported once 100% to say, you know, take this opportunity, you know, because – you never, it may not ever come knocking again, you know, and because it really scared me when I got injured because I'm like, wow, you know, my last year I've got injured. Good thing it's not a career ending injury. And that's the kind of what stuck in my head was, hey, you know, I'll make, take this chance on 
getting a career in the injury and never make it to the NFL. And so I decided to go into the draft that year. Um, and sure enough, man, I got lucky and got picked second pick second round by the Dallas Cowboys. Wow. So I got, was blessed, you know, a guy one in my dream came true. Like I told my mom, playing the NFL and playing Dallas Cowboys, it came true. So based off of that decision, it was a good decision. But at the same time, you know, in my gut, I really hate it because I didn't get a chance. We just lost because, it. There you go. Because I didn't get a chance to continue to play with the guys I came in with. Yeah. So, but it worked out well. Okay, so let's move on. You've written this book, you know, uh, and, and the main point of the book is before I forget, tell my, you know, hear my story. Tell us about your book and tell us okay. about the main parts of that book that go into your career uh, as a as a star, as a player with the Dallas Cowboys, breaking some kick return records, um, you know, that's a big deal. A lot of people get crushed by the weight of expectations. You're a high draft pick with one of the most, if not the most visible franchise in the National Football League. How did you handle that? Was that really difficult for you coming from, even though it was a big uh, program at ASU, was that really big for you? Difficult to, to deal with those expectations? How did, how did you approach that? It, it was it's it was difficult and it was it was really really difficult because, you know, like I say, you have your players that are pretty successful in college, but then doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be successful in the NFL, and because at that level everybody you know it's it's the cream of the crop you know and and when I got to Dallas you know uh, one of the guys that I idol so as a player was uh, Tony Dorsett and so you know. He kind of, kind of, when I got there, he kind of took me under his wing and just kind of fed me and kind of gave me some ideas on how to deal with being in the NFL, you know, because now what he said was the game is gone now. Now this is a business. Now this is your job. And so your whole mental outlook is going to be a little different from when it was in college and in high school. You know, when he told me that, it's like, wow, okay. I didn't never thought of it that way, you know? And so, um, and so at that point then, you know, I was just kind of just doing my normal routine, working hard, working out, uh, going to mini camps and just learning as much as I could learn um, uh, with that organization as possible. Cause the lingo was different. The players were different. Players are different. You know, it was just a whole nother world. And that adjustment, it, it took, it took time to adjust. And, you know, you can understand why a lot of players who come out of college, you know, they don't adjust to that and, and they can't adjust to that because it's different. And, uh, you know, but, but he was a mentor to me. And so it kind of got me through it. But the thing about that was, is I came out of college as a running back. And so when I got to Dallas, you know, you know, Herschel was there and Tony Dorsett was there. So my playing time as a running back would be very limited basically, you know, and so. Tony Dorsett, one of the great running backs of all time, another hall of famer as well. Yes. And so at that point, they said, well, we want to put you as a kickoff returner. That's going to be your specialty and as Lua. And then you also play on all the special teams. And that's what I did. And, you know, and I, and, and, it's, and I remember what he said, this is your job. So go out there and play and act like this is your job. And because you could lose it at any moment. And, and that's what I did. And so I made it to be as best I could as a kickoff returner. Um, and I think I averaged like over 22 yards a, uh, a return and things I need. So I was pretty successful at it and, uh, and I enjoyed doing it, but at the same time, you know, it was a lot of work. So what advice, Daryl Clack, Dallas Cowboys star returner, when somebody who's not played football, but does understand when you talk about this is a business, what advice would you give for someone going into business or trying to take their business to another level? What are the most important components of, of being successful in any business? Well, I think you have to understand what your business is, what it's all about, and, and understand that if you want to be successful at it, then you're going to have to put in the work for it. You know, it's not, it's not going to be one of the situations where you're just going to show up when you want to show up and expect to be successful. It's not going to happen that way because there's a lot of competition out there. And, you know, you know, you could be, you know, it's just like if you want to be successful, if this is what your goal is, and is this a business that you want to be in, then put in the work. Simple enough, put in the work to be successful at it. Tell us about your book. What was the objective of a book? Why did you want to write a book? And 
And what's the most important message or messages uh, from your book? It's called Hear My Story Before I Forget. And the whole purpose of the book was to tell my story before I'm no longer around. God willing, you know, because, and the reason I say it is because I had got sick and I had, I had, I had a stroke and, uh, you know, and I was in a coma for two days. And so with that, he's like, wow, you know, based off of everything I've gone through, based off of everything I've gone through in football, based off of everything I'm going through health wise, you know, this could be something that I want to share with people to let them know uh, things can happen. You know, we're athletes. Yes. And people put us on this pedestal because we're athletes, but we're human and things can happen at any, at any point in our life. And it's just a matter of what you do to overcome it, what you do to get better and what you do to heal yourself. And I took it upon myself to increase my faith at the time. Um, I took myself to work hard. I used that same work ethic that I had when I played sports. I used that to heal myself with physical therapy and things I had to do to learn to walk, learn to talk, learn to think. Um, I took the same work ethic. And, and so because, because of me playing sports like I did, it helped me with my work ethic to become better and stronger to where I was able to walk out of the hospital. Um, and so- What was your condition? That, Tell us about the name of your condition. The condition is called TTP, which is a blood disorder. And one out of three million people get this blood disorder. And so it was fairly new to, to the medical staff because they have never had that particular situation before. So they had to learn on how to treat it. Um, and so I had to go through, and, and what, it, what it does is it generates blood clots in my blood vessels once that happens, it stops oxygen flow mm -hmm. to my brain, to my heart, and to my kidneys. And so because of that, you have to go through a, 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 chain, a chain of infusion treatments to, to increase your platelet count within your body. And you weren't here. This was, you had gone into a coma in California, correct? In California, yes. San Diego, uh, Oceanside, California. So you're in, you're in a, a hospital foreign area. hospital away or, from home. For, for a whole month. And then they had to do an ambulance transfer from there out back here to Phoenix, where I was in at the Mayo Hospital for two months, two and a half months. And so just imagine going through that, you know, and, and you know, not knowing what could happen, you know. And so it was something that I felt at the time that this is something I need to share with people, you know. And so it's my journey, and it talks about everything I've gone through. It talks to it talks about concussions. It talks about uh, my illness. It talks about depression. It talks about everything that I've experienced health-wise that I'm going through health-wise and how I overcome it. It talks about symptoms. It talks about what to do if you see, uh, you know, things taking place. It's a good book for parents, young athletes, athletes, doctors, just anybody who, who has either uh, sustained some type of illness or want, know someone who's sustained an illness. And it kind of gives you like, it's like a resource that can say, hey, this is what this football player experienced. This is what he did to overcome it. And this is something that, that we can share with others to help them who may experience the same thing in their lives. One thing that I know mm -hmm. to be true for, for so many, um, really everyone, is that we can only approach our given challenge with lessons from the past. We can try some new strategies, certainly. <laughs> But if those lessons have really um, impacted you in a positive way and they've worked for you, there's no reason why you don't apply those things. So uh, you, when you were going through these dark times in the hospital and you're depressed and uh, not wondering, how, not knowing how long it will take to get through this or whether you even will, what did you do? What gave you the strength to keep going? God, point blank, God. You know, I sat there and I, I, I renewed my strength in God, and I read the Bible, his word, every single day. I prayed every single day. And, and just through his words alone was what, what got me through it because it changed my whole outlook on life. It changed everything that, uh, you know, that we always talk about but sometimes never do, you know. And so it just made me a whole different person because, you know, it, it, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here today. And, and that's it, point blank, God. And, and was there a turning point when you, first of all, you said an ambulance transfer. So the ambulance took you 
six hours, five, six hours, right? In an ambulance yeah. across the desert to the yeah. Mayo Clinic. Yeah. When did you realize you were going to be okay? Uh, I realized I was going to be okay when I got out of coma. And, and, and I'm going to tell you why I realized that. And, and it's in the book too as well. So while I was in a coma, I didn't know I was in a coma. So what happened was uh, when they, when I, when, when I started getting symptoms in San Diego, in California, they rushed me to the hospital. And then once they rushed me to the hospital, they started these the treatments. And then when they started the treatments, I was out, I was gone. I was, went to a coma. I didn't know I was in a coma. I just, I just remember just blank, blacking out. Uh, but they say two days later is when I woke up. And so, but what happened during the, the period when I was in a coma, there was a voice, and I kid you not, there was a voice that said, get up. And I actually got up, started taking wires off me, and tried to leave the hospital. Now, I didn't know this happened until the nurse told me this happened. Now, I remember hearing that voice, and, and, but she literally told me that this, that's exactly what I did, you know. And she said she had never seen anything in, in her life in all the years she's been a nurse that that has happened. And it's because I heard a voice. It just said, get up. No details. Just get up. And I got up. And so at that point, when she told me that, at that point, I knew, okay, I'm going to be okay. Because God got me up out of this for a reason. And so from that point on, that's all I'm going to talk about. That's all I'm going to do is walk and talk his word and spread the word and spread my journey and hope that at some point do this. It may heal some people or, or, or help some people and keep moving forward from that point on. You know, um, Daryl Clack, it's been great uh, getting your story and, and I hope people will uh, get your book, uh, hear my story before I forget <laughs> because <laughs> um, it's my perception and observation that everybody that has their values right belief in god being obviously a supreme value a core value when they know they don't think they know they're serving something bigger than themselves when they know that their life represents helping others that's a magic beautiful um brand on your heart and your soul that doesn't change and gives meaning to every breath you take. Yes, doesn't get any better than that. And I'm, and I'm, and Nick, you know, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy life, and I enjoy everything that he's done for me. And there's nothing that can take me away from that. And this is all you're going to hear from me. Just continue talking about him. Is there a favorite quote from the Bible, or favorite quote from somebody that you've always looked up to that you'd like to leave with everybody as we close today? I always go off. The, it's 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 in Psalms, and it talks about uh, you walk through the valley of death, fear mm-hmm. no evil, because He'll guide you through it, and that's how I walk it every day. All right. Well, thank you so much, my friend. Um, tell us your favorite charity if people want to support it. How they get in touch with you? Your website? Uh, maybe so your website. Maybe your email address. My web, yeah, my my website is darylclack.com. Um, my website is dclack42 at gmail.com. And so you can reach me through my website or my web, uh, through my email. And uh, anything I can do to help someone, uh, to help their foundation, whatever the case may be, you know, Nick, just let me know and I'm there. <laughs> well, you know, um, in life, uh, one of the things that we repeat every single show is it's not the brightness of the spotlight on you. It's the intensity of the light within you. Derek Clack, you have a lot of light, my friend. And, and I tell people, you know, because I know you're one of those people in my life, you know, just make sure you surround yourself with people that bring out your best and who you bring out the best in. And then only good things will happen. God bless you. Thank you for being part of Canaway Champions. Daryl Clack, Dallas Cowboys star, but a star in our heart too. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it, Nick. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.